What's going on guys? Today I have a really cool little interview for you and it is with Cara Leopold from leolistening.com. So this is a really cool interview. This is part one where we're going to be talking about how she ended up moving to France, how she learned French and how she adapted to the French culture. So it's a really cool interview guys. She also has an interesting accent. See if you can pick where she's from. I hope you enjoy this one and make sure that you stay tuned for the second interview which will be out shortly about how to stop using subtitles when you watch movies. Stay tuned, it's a ripper. G'day guys, welcome to this episode of Aussie English. I have a special guest for you today on today's interview episode and you might notice that she has a slightly different accent from me. Cara from leolistening.com, thanks for coming on the podcast and chatting to us about getting subtitle free. Hiya Pete, yeah, thanks for introducing me and yes, we do have a slightly, a slightly different accent. Can you tell um, me where yours is from? Can you tell me about yeah, it? Yeah, well, I would love well, to mine is a bit. Mine is a bit of a mess um, because I, I, as a kid, I used to live in Scotland. So I lived in Scotland till I was like 11 or 12 and, you know, all my family are Scottish, you know. Um, and then, so when I was sort of 11, almost 12, we moved to England. We moved to um, a city called Nottingham in England. Yeah. So like my accent started to change really rapidly because I was kind of dropped straight into secondary school and everyone was like you know you sound so Scottish I can't understand you <laughs> all this and I didn't have like a really you know I didn't have like a really broad Glaswegian accent like um, yeah Billy Connolly uh, <laughs> yeah no it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know I hadn't even li- I was born in Glasgow but I actually lived somewhere else in Scotland so um yeah like I, I actually have like me and my brother had different accents to my parents because my mum is from Glasgow and my dad's from another place so like we all had different accents so wow. even though people talk about the Scottish accent it's so like it's quite fine tuning in the UK like you kind of go 20 miles and it changes I always <laughs> wanted to know crazy. how does that how does that I guess continue into modern day life when the world is so connected and you would think in England that being such a small island or group of yeah. islands that they're in, in the Britain that you guys would mix around a whole heap but is it just that everyone is spending their developmental years as kids in a very small region getting their accent kind of cemented and then when they leave they still hold on to it? Um, yeah, it's a good point because obviously like we're massively influenced by like I mean, I've always liked watching TV. Like as a kid, I would get up really early at the weekend and like watch programs. And, you know, a a lot of them are obviously American or even Australian. Um, So you'd think our accents would be influenced as well by like media. But I don't know. I think ultimately we're more influenced by kind of the day to day like context. So when you're growing up, it's other kids. You don't want to sound like too different. You don't want to be the outsider, right? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, that was the case when I moved to England. And I think I quickly adjusted my accent because I didn't want to like stand out um, too much. And you know, I wanted people to understand me. But exactly. I think they were I think exaggerating. You get bit. sick of repeating yourself, right? When people are like, what? What? What did you yeah. say? And you're just like, uh, and that pushes you to kind of blend in. Exactly. Yeah. So my, my accent changed. Um, quite a bit like some people some people still know that I'm they know that I'm Scottish after speaking to me even just for like a a couple of minutes like they know Mm. um and I mean I've had another Scottish person say to me you know like I basically know which village you're from (laughs) because he was from he was from the same area he was like from the next village I mean that sounds insane yeah but that's how kind of yeah specific each each accent is I mean yeah that sounds that sounds crazy because in Australia does it vary very much not or? the same way uh, ours is kind of there are three I just did a video on this there are three sort of mm. accents or dialects and it's the cultivated which is more your upper class uh, received pronunciation like the British you know you would speak mm. with a very very clearly you would pronounce all the words correctly or at least properly, like according to the dictionary, and you would mm. you would be very well educated, Have tend to be from a rich family. Then there's the general, mm. which is kind of just everywhere. 
and then mm. the broad and the broad tends to be associated with people of um, either from like rural areas where they're away from mm. the city or it kind of blends in with to the lower class a little bit. So, especially with mm. guys, guys who hang out together a lot, only Aussie guys together, they tend to, to develop a bit of a broad, broader accent than... Um, yeah. And especially the further away you get from the cities. But that's why England fascinates me because you guys don't seem to have the same pattern. And we came from England, right? So, we originally came from, at least the majority of us, when we colonised Australia, we're all from small parts, I think, of England. Some of us I kept the Cockney accent. I think that's part of why we ended up with um, rhyming slang. Well, and see. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always funny. I just It blows my mind how much difference there is in England and how you guys still have trouble with each other. Because you would imagine if you... You know, the average Australian hearing cultivated, broad or general will, will pretty much understand every everyone. Mm. But that you hear people like such as yourself who say kids had trouble understanding you in um in school and you're kind of like don't you guys watch yeah. tv and see scottish people on tv like yeah i don't i don't think it's 100 percent. i don't i think everyone's exaggerating a little bit like it doesn't take that much effort to tune into someone else's accent especially because in general like it's only a like not everything changes not every sound changes you know yeah. the, in scottish in scottish english like we pronounce our r's at the end of the words um, which you don't do in other accents of English. Some of the vowels are different, like, but it's not massively different, yeah. and especially when your accent is quite um, isn't very strong. But y- yeah, it is weird. It is weird that you know. And now, obviously, it's more acceptable, like on TV and in the media, to hear all the different regional accents. And yeah. Some of them are considered quite cool. So yeah, in theory, we should be a bit better at understanding each other, but. It's funny too, I find that as an Australian, we because we watch so much media that's not just Australian, mm. as well as movies and TV mm. series, we get so used to these accents. And so, we, yeah. we tend to be able to pick where you're from too in these different countries. Like, I'm not the best at it, but I can tell North versus South and, you know, like even in watching Game of Thrones, right, where they separate them out based on that, the Scottish accents up the North and like everyone else yeah. is down there. Yeah, it's just crazy. But... It's it's yeah. funny when do you guys have trouble with Australians? If we go to the UK or because you guys have watched a lot of Home and Away and Neighbours, you guys know the Aussie accent pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I would be inclined to say that most people like even if they don't watch those soap operas now, like Home and Away and all that, like yeah. they watched them when they were younger. Or at uni, instead of going to class, they watched um, Neighbours or Home and Away. <laughs> so yeah, I think it. I would imagine that it's less it's less difficult. And also like, yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm like, I live in France now. That's probably an, also an important part of the accent piece. And uh, so last night on French TV on one of the channels, Cro- Crocodile Dundee was on. Really? Yeah. Wow. It, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff they put on French TV. Like, was that dubbed um, anyway. though? Or was that subtitles? A good question. I, they probably offered because now with like digital TV, sometimes with a film you can put it into the original yeah. version. I that, cannot I don't know. imagine watching Crocodile Dundee with dubs. Oh my god, Honestly, that would be atrocious. In France, it's really common to dub um, films, and sometimes on some channels yeah. because the audience, you know, for that particular channel or film isn't going to be English speaking. They just leave it in French. You can't even put it in English if you wanted to. Yeah, exactly. It's, so, like, last night we came across Kung Fu Panda was on some kids' channel and it was only in French. You couldn't switch it into English. Oh, wow. But well, that's the part uh, that I loved, though, as well as I hated when I was learning French really thoroughly mm-hmm. a few years ago. I just loved the fact that you could download Game of Thrones with dubs, with subtitles, mm-hmm. all in French. And so, you know, you already had watched it in English. You knew the story, but now you could watch it with French voices. Even though it was a bit strange, it was a lot more helpful for listening comprehension, not just having, you know, subtitles. Yeah, subtitles. Yeah, no, that's, that's it. It is the advantage of, um, of France because they are, they do do a lot of dubbing. You're going to be able to find material. And sometimes it's, it's really well dubbed, like, like they really get it right in terms of the tone and the register. Yeah. So, like, so the example I always go to is South Park. Really? So the very rude cartoon. The French dubbing of that is amazing. It's, like, all, it's just... It's, 
it's on point. It's so funny. The kids are obviously they are really rude. They yeah. swear a lot. They insult each other, and like all of that is kept in there, but with like appropriate French expressions for uh, for the equivalent. Because that's the hardest thing to yeah. convey, right? With TV shows yeah. like that, where there's so much more depth to it, pop culture wise, than just mm. literally translating what they're saying. You know that I I'm always mind blown when I have friends that have come over from. Um, you know, Brazil or France or Spain or wherever it is in the world, they've learned English and then they get TV shows like South Park or Rick and Morty or even The Simpsons because so much of it is like mm. Western, you know, pop culture and references to yeah. these, you know, famous people and situations. and Exactly. But, yeah, no, some, it's just, it's, that's, that's what's good in France. Yeah, there's lots of dubbed films that are, that are really, you know, well, well done. So, you, yeah, you don't miss out. Well, you obviously do miss out on hearing it in English, but at least the dubbing is kind of, it's like loyal to the spirit of the of the film. But I didn't stick around watching Crocodile Dundee long enough to actually see if it was in English or if, or the dubbed version, because it would be, I don't know what they do to do Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. In, like, how be, do they make him speak? Yeah. What accent did what's they give a, him? What's like, a broad French accent? <laughs> the racai? <but> some, or... <laughs> Yeah, sometimes what they do, yeah, they could make him speak like a, um, yeah, no, I don't think that would work. But what they, what they, they could make him speak like someone really rural, yeah. I guess, or sort of country folk. Um, I don't know where I was going with my, with my train of thought. Oh, yeah, it's like sometimes like, you know, in, um, in, in South Park, there's a character who's British, Pip. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. So what they, what they do in the French version is that he is dubbed with a strong English accent in French. Ah, uh, because, yeah, it's like, how do you convey that message too of like, yeah. Pip has an English accent on an American TV show with American kids, which makes him yeah. sound incredibly pretentious and posh. Mm. But yeah, how do you trans translate that into other languages and cultures? Because you can't really just give him an English accent because people won't get it. That's that's clever. Yeah, the, so... the French still leave him as English, but speaking French with a strong English accent. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh no, I'm so annoyed now. I should. I should have. I should have watched a few minutes of Crocodile Dundee just to figure out because they could do it like basically a French voice with a strong kind of, well, Australian sounding or at least Anglophone sounding. Yeah, um, exactly. Accent. Just squeeze yeah. Crocodile Dundee. Come on, tell <laughs> Yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, I to and, yeah that's, 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 so, so, <laughs> that's not enough. That's, that's un yeah, fine yeah. Out. I don't, I don't know how. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to YouTube that in a second and find the the dubbed version just to just to double check how they how they do it. So but, yeah, how did you impressive. end up in in France though? What's the story there? And how have you uh, found the language learning experience over in France? Yeah, so um, like I studied French at university. Oh, brilliant. Uh, yeah, so um, I studied linguistics and I studied French and um, yeah, I just, I wanted to, and I had spent some time in France like during the summers, between years at uni and I just was like, yeah, I want to I wanna go and live in France after. Um, so like a lot of people do the year abroad where they go and study in a French university or something like this. I didn't actually do that yeah. for, various, for various reasons. And then... Um, uh, my university had like a link um, with the university in the city where I live now, which is called Besançon. And um, yeah, so there was an opportunity for me to come over after my studies and teach English. So I was like, yeah, I want to do that because I'm interested in in teaching English as a foreign language. I want to live in France, and you know, there's a possibility of a it's ticking all the a, boxes, huh? It's ticking a lot of boxes, and it was a really cool job because it's like they pay you the minimum wage, but you have like 12 hours of teaching a week. Wow. Okay. So like you're, you're getting paid as if you're doing 35, wait, right, obviously. You have the to lower end, less. the lower end of 35 hours a week, right though? Or like yeah. pay wise. Yeah. But yeah, but that like, it's fine. If you're a young single person, the minimum wage in France is, is like, you know, yeah. and the cost of living is okay. So um, yeah, it was really cool. So I did that. I had a job for a couple of years teaching in a university, which is quite, um, it's quite a steep learning curve when you go to work in a university in France, because it's very different to um, the way university works in the UK and the way I imagine it works in Australia. How is that? So it's, How does it differ? Um, 
it's quite chaotic. <laughs> so oh, really? Because, um, like, as long as you've got the baccalaureate, you can go to university. This is changing at the moment, and this is why some French universities are on strike, because they want to introduce selection um, before you get into uni. Yeah. Essentially what happens in France is loads of people turn up. The first year is really the year of selection. So, like, a lot of people just drop out because they don't really know why they were they're there in the first place especially you know I was working in the sort of humanities languages um faculty yeah. and like a lot of people just kind of turn up there because they finish school they don't know what to do they've heard that if you study a language or sociology the workload is a bit lighter you don't have as many classes so they're like okay I'm just going to enroll here um yeah because it's very cheap to enroll or even free and some people get bursaries. Um, so it's, it's really good in that sense. Like it's really open, but that means that like, it's quite chaotic because um, you know, they have classes that are supposed to be kind of seminar style, but like one time in one of these classes, I had like 47 students on the register. Wow. Like obviously they didn't all turn up. They didn't all turn up like, <laughs> Fortunately, but I think for the test though they were probably they were probably all, all there. Yeah, that was the probably the time that I had they counted forty seven. So that's supposed to be like an English class where they're supposed to be doing oral expression. Yeah. Uh, and even if the maximum is supposed to be more like thirty, that's still like way too many people. Well, you just to, don't have enough time, right, to get them all to talk and to be involved. With people, yeah. yeah, and it's a lot of crowd control because French people they really like talking. Like it's not uncommon for people to talk all the way through even a lecture. Like, yeah. and I had, I had colleagues from other countries who were so shocked. Like I had a Brazilian yeah. colleague. That'd be a she big a, no, no in Australia. You would get thrown out. Oh yeah. Like it's so, it's so rude. Like, um, and yeah. So my Brazilian colleague was like, you know, I was doing a lecture and people are just, you know, they don't shut up. Like, they can't. Yeah. um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely different. You're, you're sort of less le well looked after if you're a student in France, you're kind of left to your own devices to kind of muddle muddle through you know and um uh figure it out so yeah so not everybody ends up finishing university like a lot of people leave or they do something else or so was there um, a lot of culture shock though too when you went over there like the different food the different i guess etiquette with people right there's a bit of a difference there too and uh yeah like the, well there's some there's some stuff like i knew from um sort of spending a bit of time like um, like I'd been to a summer school at a French university and I'd done sort of homestays with French families a little bit. So like I kind of knew what to expect. Yeah. Um, so that helped a bit. But yeah, I hadn't actually spent that much time in France like in when I was younger. Like we, it wasn't a, really a holiday destination for us. Like, you know, a lot of British people like to go to Spain. Exactly. So like probably went there on, on holiday or even just on holiday in, in Scotland or whatever. So um, but yeah, so like the main, the most important things I knew, but some things were still really like hard for me um, when I arrived. Like, like you know, it's really important to when you go into a shop in France, you have to say bonjour. Whereas oh, really? in the English speaking world, you can kind of you can kind of just sneak in. Yeah, exactly. Shop. Like you don't always have to say unless it's a really small kind of independent shop, then you might say something to yeah. the person who's working there. But yeah, in France, like it's really important. You have to announce your arrival by saying bonjour or, or they're supposed to say bonjour to you. So like directly um, to them or just like as in bonjour, like as in you well, walk in and I'm you're like, I'm here. <laughs> well, sometimes, yeah, like I go into the bakery, if there's a bit of a queue, I might be like, bonjour. It's just like a general bonjour to yeah. everyone. Wow. Or some people some people are a bit like, like a sort of, yeah, some people will come in and be like, bonjour, monsieur dame. You know, so kind of addressing everybody in the shop, you know. Yeah. But I don't, I don't walk in there like that. I just kind of mumble a bonjour. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny the so. differences I notice too because like I'm learning Brazilian Portuguese at the moment and mm. they are so relaxed and they have these mm. same sort of expressions that like they'll say things like oi gente which is like hi people or oi, ga <laughs> oi galera oi galera is like when you're addressing a lot of people at once so on Facebook they'll always write oi galera yeah. in the groups and it means like hi gallery you know, like a gallery of people. Ah, okay. Yeah. So Interesting. I love how that changes, but that is it Monsieur Dame? Like, uh, it's like Mr. Mrs. Hello. <laughs> yeah, Monsieur, Monsieur Dame. Bonsoir, Monsieur Dame. Monsieur, Monsieur Dame. Dame. 
Monsieur Dem. And uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's something you have to just be careful with. And then, yeah, because like some things are a bit more formal in day to day life. So the whole thing of going into the shop and saying bonjour. And the thing that always cracks me up, right? I noticed, I caught on to the fact that if you don't know someone, right, mm -hmm. even if they're more or less your age, because you age do the, the so. voo thing, right? Yeah, well, not that, but it's like the first time you meet someone, you, you would say bonjour. So even if it's a younger person around your same age, because I was like, well, surely I can just say salut, which is like ah, hi. Ah, okay. But no, if you've never met, you say bonjour. I never knew that. Or if you do, yeah, but I've noticed that and I'm like, this is stupid because otherwise, if you're young and you meet another young person for the first time, you can just say tu. You know, if you're yeah, both 25, yeah. you just say tu. And I mean, I'm, I'm 32 now, so I'm probably leaving that kind of zone of being able to just say two to whoever I want um uh yeah and if people perceive you as younger like I had to go and see um a sort of specialist doctor yesterday and it got a bit weird because you know he's calling me vu initially and then he was sort of using two because it's like oh well she's uh... y young I don't I don't know what I was just like you, you got you got to decide mate because yeah. you're <laughs> I guess for the for the context of listeners the French have vous which is like polite plural you and yeah. tu which is like singular I guess not impolite but it's kind of informal right it's what you would use it's with informal. friends and it's... it's how you get closer to someone yeah you know um so that that concept is difficult for French people learning English is like well how do I kind yes. of show that I'm on the same level as someone and it's yes. like well you can't do it with a pronoun, you do it with other things. And the funny thing is that I'm always telling my students that in Australia you will, it's like we automatically call everyone two because it, it shows that we're all friends and that we're all mm. mates. So if I met the Prime Minister of Australia tomorrow, you know, like the, the, the dude at the top of Australia, mm. he would probably say to me, g'day mate. You know, it would just yeah. be, he would treat me like I was his best friend. And that's just like a weird Australian thing where I think it's partly where anti-British establishment from when we were col mm. co a colony, you know, the last few hundred years. And as a result of rebelling against the classes, we treat everyone <laughs> like they're, um, you know, our mates. And so it's just so mm -hmm. weird. Like, I, I don't know how I would act in front of the Queen, you know. Like, I mean, I probably wouldn't say, g'day, mate, but I, it would feel probably like... <laughs> That's How's it going? <laughs> You're right. How's Philip? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. it. I know. But that's the funny thing that in Australia, the good thing is that you can get away with calling people mate or even saying dude. I noticed recently going around to different stores, I was filming some stuff for videos and I was referring to yeah. people as just dude. Hey, hey, dude, how you going? Like, you know, and people, they just yeah. don't even flinch here. It's just, eh, whatever. Uh, yeah. That's interesting because French life is definitely more formal. Like, um, also the thing, for a couple of years, I worked in a French company and I was in... Um, it was industrial, so there was like a factory and then there were the office bits. And like, it just, it's comical to me, again, like just you're spending all day bumping into people in the corridor going bonjour, or you uh, like run, in, you run into the HR manager, bonjour, shake hands, yeah, right? Or you run into the boss of the factory, bonjour, uh, shake hands, bonjour, monsieur, yeah. shake hands. And I was just like, this is, is this like a Monty Python sketch? Like, it's, it, you know, yeah. it just, sometimes it just feels really, um, silly to me, some of the sort of, you know, formal rules. But yeah, the craziest one for me is, okay, you don't know this person, but you're about the same age, you know, yeah. but you can't say salut the first time, you must say bonjour. But after that, you can say salut to this person whenever you want. That's like, And that's an unspoken other... rule, is it too, where you yes. don't even, it's not even like, oh yeah, make sure you do this. It's just something everyone seems to do, is it? I'm going to have to double check it with yeah. some French people and some Anglophones. But I, for me, I definitely noticed that, like, you know, I've said salut to someone I'm being introduced to and then they've said bonjour back and I'm like, well, uh, that was awkward. Like, you it's should like just we're be not like, yeah, quoi de neuf, mon pote? You know, what's up, what's up, matey? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll try, I'll try that. But then at the same time, you have to kiss them on the cheek. So it's yeah. like, all right. So I can't just say hi to you, but I, I place next to your face, yeah. like, how, this doesn't make any any sense. Like I should be able to say salut when we're getting, you know, very close physically. But do you get leeway though too? Those... Because you're obviously, you know, not French. To people at least go, okay, all right, you know, she's not trying to be rude or anything. She just doesn't get that we do these things without that are unspoken rules. You know. <laughs> yeah, I think I probably get away with 
yeah, to a certain extent. And also it depends on the environment. So in the university environment, people do tend to use chew with each other yeah. very easily between colleagues. Obviously, if it's the dean of the university, you'd have to use vu. Yeah. But that's quite an important... Whereas some workplaces, I think it just depends as well on the workplace culture, like how mm. formal it is or not um it is so interesting though that even obviously we have these same problems between two cultures two cultures that you would imagine would be incredibly close to one another france mm. and england and yet you guys have relatively big differences that you kind of have to stumble your way through when you're learning how to how to navigate that culture definitely definitely it's yeah you can't really understand it fully i think until you've seen it kind of on the ground and you've you've tried things out and you've yep. seen the reactions you've observed people i think you have to do a lot of kind of observation of what other people do and then you kind of go in and you know you can try it yourself but yeah you have to be a little bit careful but yeah you always you can always play that kind of foreigner card would you um, have any any advice for french people learning English and coming to England or even Australia or even foreigners in general and sort of do's and don'ts or how to get past this sort of situation uh, or l learn how to how to navigate these situations I guess these situations yeah I think like you know yeah definitely like look at what other people are doing and what's kind of yeah acceptable or not because yeah some some things that are weird from if you're coming from any culture where people kiss each other, like in France. So when we say kiss, actually what you do is you just touch the other person's cheek with your cheek and then you make a kissing noise. Yeah. So you, yeah. Know, <laughs> you know, when you when you meet someone you know and you do them on each cheek, right? That's but in, Don't kiss in, them on the mouth. That might freak them out. Cultures, like people, <laughs> in a lot of Anglophone cultures, people will hug. And I know that's a bit weird for French people. So, um, yeah. That's something I've encountered yeah. quite a bit where people I'll meet for the first time and I'll just be like, hey, give us mm. a hug. Like, you know, what's up? And mm. they'll be like, what? And you just like, but that's just what we do. We're just friendly. You know, this is like, yeah, we don't shake hands. It's a bit, it's a bit formal mm. and the kissing we don't do, but we hug. Yeah. 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 That's it. Cause it's, it's kind of awkward for my, um, like my partner's French. So he doesn't really, he doesn't even like doing the kissing, even though it's like in his culture. Oh, really? Um, Although there are, there are some men that he kisses. Like, it's really <laughs> like, um, like he's quite into the concert scene here where we live and he knows people who run record labels and organize concerts. So when he sees them, their thing is to do the kisses on the cheeks, not the shaking of hands. It's just, uh, it's just that in that context, like yeah. that's what they kind of do. Well, I guess otherwise, that's, that's a big point though, right? No matter what you know, part of the world you're going to, you kind of have mm. to not just learn in a book what the context is that you should yeah, be doing, exactly. but get in there and then you learn because it might be different for different groups and, and friends and family and it could, could be anything. This is, yeah, this is why it gets really, even like the two vu thing, when you start learning about it in books, it looks quite straightforward. You're like, yes. okay, I don't, do I know the person or do I not know the person? And then when you're actually in France, they, they add on like a million extra rules um it's really 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 complicated but anyway but yeah the hugging the hugging thing um yeah it's maybe it's maybe trial and error or i don't know if it makes you feel weird you you're allowed to 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 say it you know you're allowed to say that it's sort of a bit exactly and i think too you need to embrace the fact that you will get a free pass you know if you're a foreigner yeah, it's obvious definitely. people aren't gonna their automatic assumption will never be this guy's being a jerk He's being rude intentionally. No. Yeah, so as opposed to if I did it. If I did it to another Australian, you know, they would understand instantly that or they would have these assumptions about what I know and what I shouldn't do or should do. Whereas for you, people will give you a lot of leeway often because they think you're getting, mm -hmm. getting used to how everything works. Definitely. All right, guys, so that was it for today. I really hope that you enjoyed that interview. Massive thanks to Cara from leolistening.com. Remember that we will be back although this guy won't be back, but we will be back for the second part of this interview shortly, so stay tuned and wait for that, where you guys will learn how you can stop using subtitles, how you can get past having to use subtitles when you watch TV shows or movies. See you in the next one, guys. Bye.